And a big thank you to the support of Inmarsat for making this week of submarine live lessons possible. Now, we've got an amazing number of schools, homeschoolers, and huge amounts of families as well joining us today. And it's a big welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being part of this live lesson. It's a really exciting one. We've got Oliver Steeds, who will be joining us, and he is the mission director for Nectin. and will tell us all about the amazing work they're doing and why it's important to be a submarine explorer. But before we start, um, there's a couple of shout outs to people who have submitted those in advance. So do remember, when you book on to an Encounter EDU live lesson, you can also pre-submit shout outs and uh, questions. And we have uh, from Emma, um, sent, has sent through uh, Gethin and Evie in Cheltenham, UK. Um, we've got Gethin wants to be an engineer and Evie would like to be a vet. So massive good morning to you. But we have schools and, and students from the United Kingdom, Italy, Indonesia, Germany, India, uh, Australia, Ukraine, the USA, so many wonderful schools and families uh, joining us today. Just to let you know a rough format um, for what we're going to be doing. So we have a chat from Oliver coming up very shortly. And if there are any questions that you have of clarification, if you don't quite understand anything, um, then do please pop those in the live chat as we're going through the talk. And it's a YouTube live chat. Uh, we do have a moderator who can help you with that and be able to, to help you with any technical issues that you may have. That talk by Oliver is gonna last about sort of 15, 20 minutes. And then at the end, just throw all your questions onto the live chat and we'll try and get through as many as possible. So that's the sort of two, two sections. Um, we've got the talk by Oliver introducing this amazing world of submarine exploration, and then we'll have a good old Q&A session after that. So without further ado, it's wonderful to welcome Oliver Steeds to this live lesson. Good morning, Oliver. Good morning, Jamie, and thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I am the mission director of Necton, and for the next sort of 20 minutes, uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit of an insight as to what uh, it takes to be a mission director and give you an overview of our mission. So uh, the image that you can see perhaps in front of you at the moment is the uh, the submersible, uh, which we're using for, our, our, for this expedition, which has been called the Midnight Zone. So just to give you a sense of the Midnight Zone and this mission, we've made a little film. It's two minutes long, which I'll play for you now, which will hopefully just give you a sense of the kind of the exploration that we're going to be undertaking um, over the next uh, few, uh, throughout this week during Submarine STEM Live. So here you go. The journey down through sunlight into twilight until there is no light. Temperatures drop, pressure builds, one atmosphere every 10 meters. Welcome to the midnight zone, home to life, life under pressure, life that glows home to more different species than anywhere else in the ocean, home to the peak of biodiversity, home to up to 10 million species waiting to be discovered. It's a home of undersea mountains, tens of thousands of them, active volcanoes, far more than on land, hydrothermal vents, and subsea waterfalls. As our sun sets, this life ascends to feed. As the sun rises, they descend. This is the vertical migration, the largest migration on Earth. Every night, they draw carbon from the surface into the depths, into the midnight zone 
into the largest carbon store on our planet. So, what do we know? We're sending scientists into the deep ocean to discover and to protect what's there. The midnight zone, it's darkest before the dawn. So the mission which we are undertaking is in the Indian Ocean. Now, the Indian Ocean is the least explored and one of the least protected oceans on our planet. It makes up about 20% of the, the coverage of the ocean uh, um, on, on our planet. Um, and in the nations surrounding the Indian Ocean, there are about 2.5 billion, 2.7 billion people living in those nations surrounding it. So how the Indian Ocean changes will profoundly affect their lives and their livelihoods. As we know, as many of you will know, the ocean provides uh, a critical source of protein, a source of food for billions of people around the world. Um, it regulates our planet's chemistry. It regulates our planet's climate. So um, what we need to do is understand how that ocean is changing um, so we can conserve it, so we can protect it, so we can ensure that the lives and livelihoods that uh, require uh, a healthy ocean are able to continue. Um, now, the, there's something called the Indian Ocean Dipole, um, and this is a climate phenomenon similar to El Nino. And what it does is it magnifies the impact of climate change, and it increases the intensity, the frequency, and the impact of extreme climate events. So when we're undertaking our research, undertaking our missions into the Indian Ocean, we need to understand how the Indian Ocean is changing. And this, this uh, this climate phenomenon, the Indian Ocean Dipole, is really important uh, for us to, to start to understand the, that, the, that this can generate extraordinary impacts around the region. Um, for example, you can maybe see some of these pictures around the Indian Ocean here. We've obviously got the bushfires in Australia. There's flooding that's been in, in India and also in Indonesia. Um, a major cyclone which hit Mozambique last year as well, along with the droughts um, in southern Africa. So all these uh, climate events are being magnified by, um, by the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is driven by the ocean itself. So the research which we need to do is going to help inform you know, how the ocean is changing and how it's affecting uh, the lives and livelihoods of everyone in the region around that. So we as Nectar are undertaking a series of expeditions, a series of missions um, to explore and protect the ocean, uh, the Indian Ocean. Our goal here is to, is to see what we can do to restore a healthy and prosperous Indian Ocean. So our journey began last year in, in the Seychelles um, and where we used different submersibles. Um, the image that you can see behind Jamie uh, is one of those submersibles that we used. And we focused our research on the top 500 meters um, of the ocean there. The Seychelles is a beacon um, and, and a leader of ocean conservation, ocean management. They've committed to protecting 30% of their ocean by 2020. Scientists around the world are saying that we have a, a global need to protect 30% of our ocean by 2030. It's a movement that's been called 30 by 30. And Seychelles are a real leader in that because they are protecting 30% by 2020. So this next mission that we're, under, uh, uh, we're embarking on called the Midnight Zone um, is focused in, a, in, in, in depths from the surface down to 4,000 meters. Um, the, the Midnight Zone itself, I'll explain a little bit more later, is from 1,000 meters to 4,000 meters. Locations for this mission, beginning in Seychelles um, and then working our way up towards the Maldives. The Maldives have recently committed to protecting a large area of their ocean. So this mission, um, the First Ascent Midnight Zone, will help protect an area that's about 630,000 uh, square kilometers um, of ocean that's going to be protected as, as conserved uh, and protected areas. Uh, and that's about three times the entire uh, size, equivalent in size to the United Kingdom. So a vast area of ocean that's going to be set aside as protected areas. Beyond that as well, you know, we're also, the work which we're doing will generate the, the information that's needed for policymakers 
to actually manage their ocean in, in a sustainable way. Um, and that, that area of ocean will be about 2 million square kilometers. So the impact of this mission is going to be pretty substantial. Um, there aren't many great maps that we've got of the area. Uh, this is something that we've taken off Google. You can see how little we know. But what we've put here are the little, uh, are the little purple dots that you might be able to see. Now, they're important because those are the seamounts. Now, under the, under the ocean, we have about 100,000 seamounts, uh, which are thought to be over 1,000 meters. Seamounts are undersea uh, mountains of volcanic origin that rise from the seabed. And these are the areas of our focus. Um, and yet, extraordinarily, they remain one of the least explored areas in the ocean and on our planet. There's over 100,000 of them. We think that about 300 have been biologically sampled. So the areas that we're going to be targeting on this mission are going to uh, <clears throat> are seamounts which have not been explored uh, in this part of the Indian Ocean before. Um, so when you come to organize a mission, an expedition, um, but you've got to determine what is it, what are your goals that you're looking to, to achieve. Now, what we've done is work with and on behalf of the governments of Seychelles and the Maldives to co-define what those goals are and then say, right, how are we going to deliver those goals together? This is a mission which we as Necton are working with those governments to, to undertake. Now, the primary focus uh, of the mission is about applied research. So it's about going down into the deep ocean to, uh, to gather information that we can find down there to inform political uh, decisions to ensure the sustainable management and conservation of the ocean. But first and foremost, we need to go there. We need to put scientists in the deep ocean. We need to go and collect data. We need to see what's down there, turn the cameras on uh, in these areas which are unexplored, and then discover what is there. Get, um, the second part of the mission is to turn that data into impact. Now, as you heard, our goal is to try and help the sustainable management of the ocean, the conservation of that ocean. But you've got to turn that data that we have from, uh, from the ocean floor, from the, from, the, from the water column, all those different things which we're researching, we've got to turn that into actionable data, data that's useful for politicians um, and for ocean managers so they can actually apply that data uh, into, the, into the programs for the sustainable management of the ocean. The third area of what we do is about storytelling. Um, we believe that it's really important to tell the story of the ocean, to bring the story to, to life in a profoundly new way, to inspire people with this story of the exploration and conservation of the ocean, um, and, uh, and bring that story both to the people of Seychelles and the Maldives, show them their ocean, which they never would have seen before at these great depths, but also to audiences around the Indian Ocean and around the world. Um, what we're looking to do is try and create a public uh, public support for the political action that needs to happen. And to do that, we need to get lots of people behind it. Lots of people need to be inspired by it and willing to support the, the governments and the businesses and all those other key people, uh, partners around that, to take those, those uh, important decisions. The fourth and final area is around the long term, and we call that knowledge exchange. Um, it's working with scientists in those regions of the Indian Ocean, of Seychelles and the Maldives, and giving them, uh, supporting them with the, the, the skills, the networks, the knowledge, the, the equipment that are needed to build their, their, uh, and develop their knowledge, their capacity for long-term ocean management. It's not for us as Necton, as a, as a UK and an international organization to be able to support long-term because we can't. But the leadership and the ownership of, of the management of the ocean, the exploration of the ocean must come from Seychelles and the Maldives. So those are our four, four objectives that we have for the mission. Our focus is in the seamounts in the midnight zone. And what we have, what you can see on, on screen at the moment is um, a vampire squid. And this squid is one of the iconic species that you find at these depths um, of the ocean. But what's interesting is that on the surface of the ocean, on the surface, uh, surface waters, the top sort of 50 meters or so, that's where you have the greatest biomass, the greatest quantity of animals uh, in the ocean. However, the deeper you go, um, the, the, more, um, the more different animals you have. So the greater the biodiversity that you have deeper down in the ocean. So we think, scientists think, that between about 1,000 and 3,000 meters, this is the peak of biodiversity. This is where there is the greatest amount of different animals in the ocean at these depths, not at the surface where we've got the greatest number, but down at these depths. 
So our focus is, uh, on this mission is to look at a series of CMANs, a um, uh, minimum of six, we hope it would be more um, CMANs in this region, uh, and document what it is that we're going to find down there. Um, so this is our, our, an aerial shot of our mothership. It's called the, the, uh, the pressure drop. Uh, on the front of the vessel, you've got the bow, then you'll move across. Uh, uh, if you're working backwards towards the stern, the, the structure you have there, that's the bridge. And as you go further, you've got a sort of a large superstructure, which is where the people on board uh, live. So we have 50 people on board uh, on this mission uh, undertaking the, uh, this expedition. Um, in the, the superstructure of the vessel, we've got wet labs, uh, laboratories for taking, um, uh, taking the samples that we find and processing them, identifying them under microscopes. We have a dry lab where we, we do uh, more analysis, video analysis that we get from the submersibles as well. We also mounted at the bottom of this, uh, this vessel, um, we have a, what's called a multi-beam, so we can map the seabed um, at great depths. Um, and right at the back, that, uh, that structure, the white structure that you see with a crane off the back, that is the submersible hangar. So that is where the submersible is kept and uh, it's launched uh, and recovered using that, uh, uh, the frame that you see at, the, at the, uh, the stern of the ship. So now into the technology. We have a whole range of different technologies that we are going to be using on this mission. Um, about a dozen uh, different uh, technologies from, so we can undertake research from the surface, all the way down to the depths. But this is the most iconic piece of technology at the heart of this mission. This is a, a, a submersible built by our partners Triton, which is called the Triton 36002, um, or otherwise known as the limiting factor. Um, this submersible um, has just, um, with the mothership, has been going around the world for the last two years and diving to the deepest parts of the world's ocean the deepest parts of the world's five oceans on an expedition called Five Deeps. This submersible is the only submersible in the world which is capable of diving to the deepest parts of the ocean. That's seven miles down, 11,000 feet. Um, and this submersible has already achieved that. It's undertaken five, I think, dives to uh, the deepest part of the, of the, of the ocean, um, which is called Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench. Um, and you can see uh, the image uh, is split. So the image uh, of the whole submersible, you've got what looks like two eyes. Uh, you can just make out a, a, a kind of another eye beneath there or a mouth in the center of the screen. Um, those are the viewports. So there are three viewports um, on, the, on the submersible so you can see out. Obviously, you've got lights and you can see the thrusters mounted. Um, at the top, you can see a little hatch and pilots uh, and the co-pilot enters uh, there. You can see the submersible behind me as well. Um, so before the submersible goes down, the, the pilot and the co-pilot will climb out into, uh, into the submersible there, and there's a hatch there, and then go down all the way through this, this structure. There's a bit of space down there, and then enter um, uh, at the bottom um, here. This is the, the pressure hole. So the submersible, um, the pilot and the co-pilot will be able to go down there into the, the, the pressure hole that's made of titanium. It has to be extraordinarily strong to be able to withstand the pressure at those depths. So to give you a sense of the, the, the pressure that we have at 11,000 feet, uh, sorry, 11,000 meters uh, uh, depth, um, it's 1,100 times the pressure that we have on the surface. It's equivalent, I think, of, a, maybe of having about 50 jumbo jets resting on the top of your head. So you need something that's extraordinarily strong to be able to withstand it. So if we go back to the image uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the presentation there, um, you'll see a cutaway of the submersible. So you can see how people climb down through that hatch into the submersible. You've got the pilot and the co-pilot who, who are inside there. And inside they have screens around them as well because the submersible has a number of cameras which are mounted around there which provide situational awareness so you can see what's going on around um, as well as uh, all the controls and oxygen systems that you need. An average dive in the submersible will be 8 to, to 12 hours, but it also has life support for 96 hours should we need it. Um, I'm going to quickly go in now into the science mission. Um, throughout this week, we're going to hear a lot more about some of these areas. We're going to hear from Triton uh, later this week. It will tell you a little bit more about the submersibles, and you'll, learn, uh, you'll hear a little bit more from uh, our scientists as well about the scientific mission. So I'm going to give you a very quick overview now of our scientific mission. Uh, this image you can see at the moment, is um, 
it was taken off our first mission in Seychelles. And this is a very different type of submersible that we're using for this mission. Able, this only enables us to go down 300 meters. The submersible we're using for the midnight zone, again, enables us to go 11,000 meters. So our research is we're looking to undertake research from the surface all the way down to the deepest parts of the ocean. So where we are in, in the Indian Ocean, we think the, uh, the maximum depth there is going to be about three, uh, be about three, four, five thousand 5,000 meters. So we have different technologies that enable us to do the research um, at, at those different depths. So what you're seeing in front of you is uh, firstly uh, is the multi-beam system. So we map the seabed, see what the seabed looks like, uh, which enables us then to safely deploy the submersibles um, and target particular areas where we think there could be interesting areas for research. Beneath that, you can see uh, uh, that's um, a coral sample. We'll be taking samples, um, th uh, biological samples throughout the mission. We can do that using a, a manipulator arm that's mounted on the submersible. We also look to undertake research uh, in, in the water column. Uh, in the, the image in the middle there, you can see that, that, con that construction there, that, that, that piece of machinery is called a midwater bruv. And that's got uh, cameras mounted on it, uh, which are baited so that we can uh, document what, uh, what animals live in the water column, or in the pelagic, as, it's, as we call it so in scientific terms. So this midwater column, this midwater bruv, uh, enables us to see those big charismatic animals, those deep diving sharks or tuna or other animals which are uh, made, that we'll be able to see in those areas. Moving along now, two final little area, things that we look at. This um, the system, which looks a bit like a rocket launcher, that is called a CTD. Uh, for researching water chemistry, conductivity, temperature, and depth. Um, and we take samples of, of the water column, water chemistry, um, physical samples of the water as well, which we can analyze for, for DNA as well, for, for genetic research and other things. Um, and then finally, some nets. So on the surface, we're looking at to, to, to do some surface trawls to see if there's plastic at, at the, at, on the surface, but mainly to look at zooplankton, which is the basis of the marine food web. Um, so the focus of our research is going to be on um, uh, is going to be on seamounts, um, and the, the you can see here on these images this is what the structure of some seamounts look like. These are very conical, steep, uh, steep um, seamounts, and they're critical for life. You have reefs, deep reefs on these uh, on these uh, on these undersea mountains. You have uh, different habitats, complex marine habitats, and they're also hot spots for biodiversity. Um, so we find. That um, yeah, they are these little mount. They are quite large, substantial mountains, which we we find across the ocean in different areas. And often these are the areas that we find a lot of life. Um, but obviously, one of the key ele elements of focus is to be able to turn our science into impact. Um, so gathering that scientific data to meet with uh, and then meet with the politicians. You're seeing here that uh, this is Dr. Lucy Woodall, who's our principal scientist, and Sheena Talma from Seychelles. Um, there are two of our leading scientists, and they will be giving you a, 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 a more detailed um, um, presentation about the research which we'll be doing on our mission um, uh, later this week. And there you can see Lucy and I meeting with the president of, uh, of, of the Maldives as we start to develop and implement our mission. So um, I'll leave it there. Um, uh, here is an image of, of a blue whale you can probably see there. And... Um, these are one. These animals can can dive to great depths in the ocean. So um, up to about 500 meters is where you can find a blue whale, the largest animal in the world. Um, but um, there's, I can take you further down if Jamie allows me to take you deeper into the ocean and show you what other extraordinary animals we find at different depths of the ocean. But now over to you, Jamie. I, I imagine there's lots of questions after this quick introduction. Oliver, thank you so much. Um, an amazing introduction to the Net Mission, this extraordinary work you're doing in the Indian Ocean. Uh, as you, you've, you've mentioned, we do have other members of the team who will be talking about their specialist areas over the next uh, four days of this week. So Tuesday, uh, we've got Dr. Lucy uh, Woodall, who will be talking about the, uh, the, the, the sea mounts and the science side. On Wednesday, we're going over the, the team and all the different roles and STEM careers. And then we have on Thursday, these submersible um, experts from Triton talking about some of the technology and then looking at conservation and why all this really matters. 
uh, to the ocean on Friday. Um, but thank you for that. We've got some uh, wonderful questions coming over the live chat. So I'm just going to go over to those now and, and pass some over to you. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things we were talking about um, before was what is the difference between a submersible and a submarine? And that uh, question is through from Arnav Gupta. Uh, great question. Um, so the difference between a submarine and a submersible is that a submarine can operate independently. It doesn't need a support ship. A submersible needs a support ship. So you saw earlier, our support ship is called the Pressure Drop, um, and that is a, a large research vessel. Um, and um, we need to be able to recover the submersible back to the surface to be able to recharge the batteries, resupply it before it can dive again. So submersible needs a support ship. A submarine can operate independently. Amazing. Uh, the next question I have through is from uh, Sharon um, Nia Kumar. Um, I'm going to test your science knowledge here, Ollie, uh, and see if you can answer this. Does every animal in the midnight zone have this bioluminescence, have this uh, luminosity to them? Yes. Yeah, so if we, uh, if we scroll through, uh, let me show you a picture there. Can you see that? Um, that image, which I'm going to put up on the screen now, this is a glow-in-the-dark shark, uh, which was recently... Um, uh, recently identified by a brilliant um, uh, American uh, scientist called David Gruber. Um, so to answer your question, do, are all animals bioluminescent in the midnight zone? No, we don't think so. Um, but this is an area of, uh, that is still being investigated. Uh, I think the, 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 uh, the estimates are about 80 to 90% of all animals in the deep ocean are bioluminescent. Now, what you can see with this glow-in-the-dark shark, I hope you can see it. Can you see this? Yes. Um, this glow-in-the-dark shark, the reason they discovered it uh, and this sort of camouflage-looking, um, uh, this camouflage look uh, that it has to it, is because David decided that if he wanted to s understand what this shark looked like, he needed to see through the eyes of another shark. So he managed to get hold of an eye shark, the shark, uh, an eye of a shark, work with... Um, uh, um, experts to be able to try and re recreate um, the structure of, a, of the um, eye of a shark and then you create a camera that could have the same um, the same uh, qualities as that shark's eye. So they were able to do that and as soon as they were able to do that they could then see the world of the midnight zone through the eyes of other sharks and they could therefore see the bioluminescence that was around uh, on these other animals, which they weren't otherwise able to see. And when they did that, this is what they discovered. This is what this shark looked like. So the great challenge that we have at the moment is to, sit, is to work out how we can see in the same way that sharks and other animals in the deep ocean see. If we can do that, then we'll be able to really answer your question about how many animals in the deep sea are bioluminescent. Our best guess at the moment, about 80 to 90%. That's amazing. Thank you, Oliver. And, and it's a great, great question. Um, this question is from Gethin and Evie in Cheltenham. Uh, and they would really like to know, how long can you stay down there on the water? How, I mean, there's probably an upper limit, but what's the length of a normal dive for you guys? Um, so when, if you're diving to full ocean depth, like Victor Vescovo, who is the great pilot who recently dived to, uh, to Challenger Deep, um, that dive to get down 11,000 meters took about three and a half to four hours. He then spent about four hours down there at the deepest parts of the ocean, and then another four or so hours to come back. So his full dive was about 12 hours. Um, on our missions, uh, we'll be diving to maximum of four or 5,000 meters, um, but we'll be wanting to undertake a, a bit more time down on the seabed um, so we can undertake more research when we're down there. So we our average duration of for our dives would be about seven to ten hours um, for the type of dives which we'll be doing. So in the in that small confined space which you can see behind me, um, yeah, this is uh, yeah, it's 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 quite a long time for those for, for that kind of period. Um, but we also have um, life support, so oxygen and um, and uh, and food supplies for ninety six hours. So if we were to get stuck. We've got 96 hours for someone to come and get us out. 
Amazing. Very sadly, we haven't got a huge amount of time left, but we've got lots of questions. Come on, can, can we go into a bit of a quick fire round? Yes, yes, oh, quick answers. Go for it. Okay, so Caroline Hogarth, uh, question through, can you go into the bottom layer? Can you go right down to the bottom of the ocean? Yes, the deepest part is called the Hadal Zone. Um, the submersible has just come back from diving into the deepest parts of the world ocean. Very few, it's the only machine in the world which can take people down there. Amazing. From Barney Warfolk Smith, um, this is what was the most surprising moment that you have had during your dives? Most surprising moment, um, I think, was the discovery of a fo well, essentially a forest, a uh, subsea forest on the top of a seamount in Bermuda. No one had dived there before. We went down and we found this forest of seaweed and algae and all sorts of life there. Um, it's not every day you get to be the first person to discover a forest. So that was um, probably the biggest highlight for me so far. Amazing. A whole, a whole new forest on the water. Um, from um, Daniel Chantler, and this may be a really great question uh, for Thursday's uh, conversation, but do you know how long it takes to build a submersible? <laughs> Good question. Um, I think it took about two or three years to build this one. It's the first one of its kind. The little ones, which we now, uh, if you're uh, for uh, to dive in more shallow waters, down to 300 or 1,000 meters, those can be built in uh, nine to 12 months. But uh, a new build like this was, uh, I think, two to three years. Great. We have now um, from Simon uh, Pan Pering, what is the strangest creature in the ocean? <laughs> Depends who you are. I mean, I... What, if you ask those, if you ask a creature that, they probably won't think that they're strange. I mean, I think they're all pretty awesome. Um, there's all sorts of uh, extraordinary animals down there. If you go on screen here, um, what sure we can go on screen. This is probably my favorite. This is called the siphonophore. Um, and this is the longest animal in the world, 40 meters long, and it's got 300 stomachs. So uh, this is probably uh, one of the, the strangest ones out there, the siphonophore, um, but uh, it's pretty awesome in my book. Oliver, we've got so many questions. Do you mind if we extend this um, live yeah. lesson by sort of five, ten minutes? As long as you want. As long as you want. <laughs> Perfect. Um, uh, Vihan would like to know how you control the submersible. So the submersible is controlled from in two ways. Uh, firstly, if you're the pilot, you're inside, you have a joystick, um, and that has ten thrusters around that. So that enables you to move uh, in different directions, left, right, up and down, and what's called translate if you're moving in front of, of a uh, cons uh, building, uh, not building, um, <laughs> of a uh, seaman. Um, so it's a bit like a helicopter, if you like. Um, you know, that you're moving in the three dimensions because uh, like a helicopter would, but you're underwater. So that's a good way to kind of think about it. The other way this, is, this submersible can be controlled or this particular submersible can be con can controlled is from the surface. We can send acoustic signals from the ship to the submersible and take control of the submersible if there's any problem. So if we haven't heard from the submersible after a fixed time period, then we can then um, take control of the submersible and trigger it to come back to the surface. So those are the two main ways that you can control the sub. And this, this one I, I really, really want to, to know the answer to too. Uh, it's from Electro Skull 57 um, who would love to know, um, how do underwater waterfalls work? That is a very good question. I'm going to pass the buck to Lucy on that one. Uh, she can answer that one tomorrow. But what I can tell you is um, the, the highest waterfall in the world is, and the waterfall with the greatest amount of water goes over it is, uh, is uh, off Greenland somewhere. Uh, it's called the, the Denmark Strait. and It's a cataract. Um, and it is three times the height of Angel Falls, which is the highest waterfall on land. And I think it has over 300 or 100 times, I need to check, get my numbers sorted out, but uh, over, over a, a, a huge amount more amount, a large amount of water goes over the, um, goes over the waterfall, uh, then goes over Niagara Falls when it's a full flow. So it is by volume and by height, the greatest waterfall on earth. How it works uh, is that it's, my understanding is that it's a cataract. Um, and so you have, um, uh, the current systems um, and uh, and the flow of water, um, uh, which has been pushed over over that in that direction. Um, but I will defer to Lucy, who can provide you with a, a far more intelligent and scientific answer to it in uh, in uh, tomorrow. I think she's on tomorrow. Is she, Jeremy? 
Yeah, she, she, she's on, on tomorrow at um, 9.30 and I think 1 o'clock um, UK okay. time. Uh, the time zone checker is on all the live lessons on the Encounter EDU website. Right. Uh, but we have a question through from Daniel Chandler, who would love to know, have any of the submersibles been attacked by a creature of the deep? Uh, have our submersibles been attacked? Uh, not as far as I know. We've had some encounters. Um, we're down at um, in Seychelles, I think Seychelles, uh, earlier this uh, last year, and we had a, a big ray which came down and sat on the, the top of the submersible for a while and sort of rubbed its belly on the top. But really, it was just like having, having, I think, having a bit of a rest and checking us out. We've had big groupers, uh, very large fish, come and kind of check us out under there. But we haven't uh, been uh, in a situation where we've had people that can, uh, we've had our submersibles attacked in any way by animals. Um, we do know, of course, that some some animals, um, yeah, do attack others. You know, for example, the giant squid and um, and orcas uh, and other deep diving whales. We understand do sort of wage war against each other at great depths. Um, but uh, as yet, uh, we have not been attacked by any uh, animal of the deep, um, which is a relief, quite frankly. I mean, maybe the follow-up question almost to that is, Els would, was, is interested by the, by the giant squid, whether you've seen one, and if you, what depths would you need to be at to, to come across a giant squid? Um, so I have not seen a giant squid. The first time uh, a giant squid was actually documented was in one of these submersibles, um, which if we can cut to Ellie, um, Ellie's image, because she has an image of a submersible behind her, um, Ellie will be, this is the submersible, another Triton, a 1,000 meter, uh, three person submersible. And it was in a submersible, uh, maybe that exact sub, but one very similar to that in which they found the, 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 the they were the first to document the, um, the giant squid. Uh, and they were able to do that by drawing it in using bioluminescence. So uh, giant squid um, uh, used by a, a form of bioluminescence to, to help their, their hunting. Um, and a, uh, a brilliant professor called E.D. Witter devised, that created the system to be able to actually um, draw in giants, uh, a giant squid so they could document it. Um, so I have yet to, yet to see it. There is actually a squid that's even bigger than the giant squid. It's called the, uh, the colossal squid, um, and that's the size of a minibus, I understand, and no one has yet seen one of those squid in... Um, uh, in their natural environment in the deep sea. They're still waiting to be discovered. Great, and, and thank you, Oliver. Um, I mean, there's so, much, so many questions uh, coming through. I'm just gonna pick a couple here. Um, is, this is from um, Simon Pan Pering. Is, is, I mean, you talked about the siphonophore as, as being the strangest creature. Perhaps you could just tell us a little bit more about why you think it's, it's so strange. Um, Good question. I mean, I think, yeah, it, it, A, it's, it's, a, it's an enormous creature. You know, they can grow to 40 meters long, so the longest animal, I think, in the world. Um, and also, you know, it's, um, it has 300 stomachs. So the, um, yeah, it's, it, it, its ability to be able to, to feed and support itself. Um, and of course, you know, if you're, if you're able to see what's on the screen now, um, you know, it, um, it looks um, like something, um, yeah, uh, something that, you know, that, that I can't think of anything else on the planet that looks anything like that. Um, so it looks different. It's got more stomachs than anything else on the planet, and it's the longest animal in, in, uh, on, on land. So in my book, that's uh, three good reasons why it's uh, a unique and extraordinary animal. Incredible. Um, so a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to put these together. Um, one from Els and one from Tanoush. Um, Els is what is your deepest dive, and then Tanush is, is following on from there. Is what are Hadels? What is this Hadel zone that we, we were referring to? Um, good question. So we have uh, different depths of the ocean: um, the sunlit zone, the top two hundred meters. Then you get into the twilight, down to a thousand. Midnight zone is one thousand to four thousand. The abyssal zone, four to six thousand meters. And then the Hadel zone is from six thousand to eleven thousand meters. Now these are tend to be trenches. Which are opened uh, opened up on the seafloor by the movements of tectonic plates, and these then create these these deep trenches in different parts of the world's ocean. So we have the Tonga Trench, for example, which is the deepest part of the Indian Ocean. You've got 
the Mariana's Trench, which is the deepest part of the Pacific, and in which you have Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the ocean. Um, so the Haydor Zone is uh, is where you have um, these uh, these trenches and unique animals at these depths. Uh, it was in one of these trenches that uh, a scientist called Dr. Alan Jameson from the University of Newcastle discovered the deepest fish, which I think is around about 8,100 or so meters, and that was a, something called a snail fish. So you have animals which live in these great depths uh, and these hadal zones which don't exist anywhere else on the planet. Um, he's just been doing research into these different trenches, and uh, in the coming months, I think we'll be able to we'll have we'll have some significant breakthroughs in our understanding of what lives at these depths. Incredible. Um, I mean, Jake was wondering, uh, just just on a, a sort of practical basis, how, how many people in, in a crew in, in a submersible, and then maybe how many people do you need to have topside on the ship uh, for a dive? So on this, uh, well, our mission crew, um, you can see on our um, uh, on our mothership, we have fifty people or 48, 49 people on them on the mission. Um, our submersible crew is five, so that includes a pilot, a submersible uh, surface officer, so running communications from the surface down to to the submersible. We also have electrical engineer um, and a mechanical engineer that's on board, um, and then we have uh, yeah teams of engineers to support the maintenance of the submersible because every time it comes back, we've got to recharge the systems. We might need to fix something. Um, and we've got to keep it running. Um, so our sub team is five, and then we have a science team, which is a bit bigger than that. It's about 10 people, a little media team, survey team of two, two surveyors, and then a ship's crew of, uh, of about 20, 21, 22. So it's, uh, it's a huge group of uh, number of people which need to go to sea if we're going to undertake missions like this. It's not just the sub team, but you need all those others around there to make that sub actually work. Amazing. Um, Arnav, I mean, we were talking about this a little bit before and we've mentioned it a couple of times, but Arnav, just to go through the difference between an HOV or submersible, an ROV and a, an AUV. So we have an HOV, it's a human occupied vessel, which is a, a, a manned uh, submersible like this one or like the other subs that you've seen. Then you have an ROV, which is a remotely uh, operated vehicle, which is essentially a robot which is on a tether. And that tether comes back onto the top of the ship. So people on, on their kind of uh, on their joysticks or little PlayStation controls, if you like, they can control the sub submarine, uh, they can control these underwater robots to do specific work at depth. And then you have an AUV that's an autonomous underwater vehicle. So those are, are machines um, uh, that you can put into the water, you can throw them into the water, and they work independently. They work autonomously. So they don't have a tether and they don't have anyone inside them, and they can go off um, into the ocean and do program tasks. Um, so they're like drones. Essentially, you can put them into the ocean, program them what to do. You can control them remotely as well, um, uh, some of them, uh, if you have the right type of um, machinery to do that. Um, but most of them are autonomous. Amazing. And, and we, we talked a little bit before about the Hadal zone. This is a question from Julian Church. And we've got these quite artificial numbers. He, he's, he's talking about the midnight zone. And it starts at 1,000 and starts and then finishes at 4,000. How are those two depths determined? Um, they're determined by, so you have, uh, they're determined by, uh, for a range of different reasons, by the types of habitats which are which you find at those depths. The surface area, you know, where there's sunlight, that is um, uh, the sunlight, the sunlit zone uh, is where we have enough light for there to be photosynthesis. So that enables light and life to occur. Then from a thousand, from 200 down to a thousand, you go into the twilight zone where there is very, very little light um, still there. But that, uh, you've got a lot of animals that are being fed uh, from um, uh, the photosynthesizing organisms in that sunlit zone and, of, and feeding uh, down into those depths. So twilight is, is describing um, the, the depth of ocean where there is very little light. There are more scientific names for these different depths, of course, uh, which Lucy can go into. But these, the names that are provided here are those which um, uh, are both scientifically accurate, but also they try to uh, capture the spirit of these different depths. Um, so if you get into uh, yeah, the abyssal zone, um, the average depth of the ocean is 4,200 meters. So once you get beyond the midnight zone, the abyssal zone, you, uh, you, uh, the, 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 the type of, uh, of uh, seascape that you have there is 
is, are, the, are these vast uh, abyssal areas, and you get a lot of large, um, <clears throat> you get a lot of large flat areas, uh, and then uh, that's where you then get these seamounts that are rising up from the seabed up to those, uh, up to those, um, uh, those shallower areas as well. And then the Hadal zone is defined really by those, uh, by the uh, the movements of those tectonic plates, which creates um, those um, those big gorges, if you like, those canyons in the deep sea. Amazing. I think we've got time for just two more questions, um, and I'm just going to sort of fo focus on a couple more of these g general ones. One of which is, um, which has been asked by a number of people, is is what kind of creatures might you expect to come across in the Hadal zone? In the Hadal zone? Um, so let me just scroll down. So you have, um, I mean, the deepest diving uh, living fish is 8,178 meters, and that is um, the snailfish. So beneath that, you don't get much in the way of, uh, of fish, of course, um, but um, that's where you can get these, these large amphipods um, and other animals at those depths. Um, and there's very little research which has been done at those depths. So um, let me see if we've got anything, if I scroll down through my presentation. Nope, we don't have anything of, of any great depth. But uh, I'll leave you with an image uh, of this animal, if we can see it now, which is the, uh, uh, the anglerfish, um, which is one of the most extraordinary animals um, of, of the midnight zone, which is the area which uh, our mission is focused on. Perfect. And, and to, 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 to end up with <laughs> all these amazing deep sea creatures, are these things that you can keep in aquaria or are, can they only survive in their natural habitat? Um, these animals can only really survive in their natural habitat. They've evolved to, 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 to live at great depths under significant pressure. Uh, so if you were to bring them up from those depths, of course, their, their, their anatomy, their, their bodies would change. So unless you can uh, create a, a, an aquaria which is similar in temperature, similar in pressure to those experienced at, at the depths of the midnight zone, you're not going to see them uh, as you would at those depths. Um, there are some systems which are, enable you to sample organisms at depth and maintain them within that within a similar pressure or the same pressure. Um, but as far as I know, there aren't any sort of large aquaria which can do that. Oliver, it just remains for me to say thank you so, so much uh, for being part of this and for sharing these great insights into the, this extraordinary expedition that you're setting up, this series of expeditions that you're setting up to explore the deep ocean. Really, really exciting uh, to have you. Thank you so much uh, to all the great questions that came through on the live chat, to everybody who's watching. It's been amazing having you. And also thank you to Inmarsat, uh, who are making Next in Submarine STEM 2020 possible. Just to let you know what is coming up uh, later this week, Oliver is back on at 1 p.m. today, UK time. Um, just in case those have missed out on today or in different time zones, for instance, in the U.S., and just to say that a few hours after each of our live lessons, these will be available on the Encounter EDU website uh, to watch on Catch Up and also on the Encounter EDU YouTube channel. So coming up this week, uh, we also have Dr. Lucy Woodall, who will be talking about uh, the wonderful underwater world um, and uh, mountains under the sea on... Uh, who do we have after that? We have then a look at, at exploring the deep, and that is looking at all the different STEM careers uh, involved in this kind of work. On Thursday, we have the Triton team talking more about the technology and engineering of submersibles, and then we have submarine conservation. So how does all this amazing work go into preserving our wonderful ocean? So thank you so much for being part of Submarine Explorer. Uh, until the next time, it's goodbye from me and probably goodbye from, from Oliver too. Thank you.